Hey, Vitamin D. <laughs> had a had a sick. How you doing? Good. <laughs> had a pack patch of uh, sickness going around the house mm. a few months back. I got on the interwebs and started looking stuff up and mm. kept seeing vitamin D, vitamin D. I've always heard vitamin C for sickness. Heard vitamin D, and I did this. I did something kind of, kind of wild, kind of out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, the recommendation was taking twenty thousand. That's a lot. IU of vitamin D for yeah. a couple of days in a row. Yeah. To knock it out. Yeah. And holy shit, did it knock it out? Yeah. It knocked it out. Huh. Like I felt, and actually when I took it, uh, I I immediately felt like energy. Yeah. Like it was immediately. Yeah. Fifteen minutes. No, totally. And then um, next few days, like later that day, my my. Cold started to subside, and I started feeling better. Last couple of years, the medical community has been doing a lot of research on vitamin D. They haven't drawn a ton of conclusions on it, actually, but uh, yeah. if you have a low vitamin D, it should be addressed. I found I did find a couple studies. Yeah. Um, that I, so I did back like, it on. Like, like I didn't just take it. I having found, like I have naturally low vitamin D levels. Do you? Um, so if I if I'm feeling really morose i know i'm probably running short so i go i go take some vitamin d and it, it, it brings me back what i read is it's best to take preferably like in the morning yeah. when you're doing when you're eating something with fat in it yeah it's fat soluble yeah also with vitamin k and vitamin a they help with um synthesis yeah vitamin d in particular because there aren't a lot of naturally occurring um, sources of sources it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. of it right which right, is right. why but the a and k there are so you can part of the reason why i eat eggs every day oh yeah because there's a natural naturally occurring vitamin d so i actually don't take the pill anymore because i eat eggs every day and it actually helps me you're off the pill now i have to say <laughs> we all think we might have a past life maybe not all of us maybe some of us but if you did have a past life you absolutely would have been an apothecary me With the, yes oh yeah yeah oh my god could i i could still be one i could be <laughs> I could read, right? Apothecary. Let me spell it. And then I'm in. Are there schools for that? <laughs> I should probably. I bet Jamil might have some, some insight. I on bet that. I have some people that are not going to be happy that I get into apothecary. <laughs> apothecary? <laughs> okay. We're out of here. <laughs> Welcome to, or welcome back to, More In Common. This is our social experiment. See, everyone has a story that can help us learn from one another. And we bring people into this safe space that we have learned to create so we can learn about their stories and get into difficult topics that challenge us in conversation and ultimately how we think. And we have a lot of these conversations. And we're seeing a lot of similar threads through all of them. So what we're doing is breaking down these conversations to create a set of tools and a map that will help you become a conversation boss so that you can be a catalyst for conversation in your day-to-day life. You got to get out to our website, www.moreincommonpod.com, where you can find all things More In Common. And we got, like, we just got so much stuff out there, I'm not even going to tell you. You just got to go. It's like, a little, it's like a grab bag of fun. Get after it. Last week's episode was Thomas, Thomas Knox, our friend our chess compatriot ever since that episode we started playing chess together uh keith well in one-on-one like i play thomas keith plays thomas thomas plays thomas and um what'd you take from that episode other than chess playing oh my god one um this was recorded late in 2018 um so some some dated references there uh but not not culturally just for thomas himself um some profanity so always like to disclaimer that but boy what did i take away from it um so many things one of the big things is like how he grew up in foster system Mm -hmm. and we often have the tendency not everybody but there is a swath of the culture that ultimately writes off people um and i think he's just a an individual that represents don't judge a book by its by its cover mm-hmm. right he uh and and even to like the same principle to his parents um you know they they had a different way of life but they raised him to be the man that they wanted to be not the people necessarily that they, that they thought they were right um and i just think he's such a great example of of the possibility of all of us 
uh, regardless of where we come from. And that's very much in line with like Rachel growing up in extreme poverty, right? Mm-hmm. And the way that she she had to to come out of that. Um, and I got to tell you, the biggest thing, like the conversation about his dad and the the polarity between the two of them and how different they are um, and how they confront it and how they're open about it. And it's not one of those things of, oh, my God, my dad, right? Like they're, they're open and honest about their relationship. I just think it's phenomenal. And I, I, I think about these, the dynamic of these relationships all the time as it relates to how how we approach things and mm. i just think it's fascinating and phenomenal how about you yeah um i think it's interesting that you disclaimered the explicit nature of the episode after the episode but i like it i like it um <laughs> <laughs> um oh my God. we we are well into the 2019 year of reckoning that he that he mentioned and he is moving he is he's getting after it and uh happy to be partnering with him on some of his ventures and endeavors right now we're well into so we're well into his year of reckoning and just his demeanor the way you know like the comment like i asked him if he you know how his dad would look at him marrying a white woman or dating a white woman and he's just like look man he's like I'm going to date somebody who loves me for me. I'll date somebody who's 400 pounds or who's anorexic or who's just the way, the the, the way he explained, he's like, I want to be with somebody who loves me the way that I love them and that I need to be loved. Like, bam. He's like, I think that nails so much of what so many miss. And I mean, I, I say that looking at myself. Um, and lastly, um, the thing he said that his goal is to enrich people's lives in a way that no one has ever thought of. I mean, that's just, that's just a powerful statement and, and he's doing it. Like I see him doing exactly that and just really glad we got to connect and that we're staying connected and that I'm kicking his ass in chess. <laughs> he's kicking mine. It's <laughs> awful. <laughs> Big ups, Thomas, you'll get there. Um, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, that's that's that. So what do we what do, what do we got coming up for uh, for today? Ali Lucchetti. Um, so Ali grew up in Elgin, Illinois, uh, and she actually learned at an early age that she had challenges with anxiety, like hard challenges. And um, after years of understanding and learning about her anxiety, she now aims to help others understand how she got to where she is and to let people know it is okay. Uh, she is the founder of All Roots Wellness, um, spelling in the show notes, a healthy lifestyle blog that uh, started as a safe space for her to share her journey managing anxiety disorder through healthy living and 360 um, wellness. From healthified recipes and uh, superfoods to mindfulness, movement, and mind hacking, uh, she shares her honest approach to staying sane in today's busy world um what do we talk about we get into the impact of words such as no and should especially when managing mental health and her anxiety having anxiety at a young age and what that experience was um, processing experiences and how everybody does it differently and um we i mean really we just get into a lot of different facets of anxiety which if i had an observation for this week it would be that i learned a lot sitting back uh this is a sit back a, a largely a sit back episode and I, I jumped in with questions but anxiety is something that i don't i don't understand well so i learned a lot from it well uh, what tips you got yeah i mean I, that leads to one of the big tips is you know this the demonstration i think in this episode of engaging with curiosity um you know i think we do that well in most of our episodes but you know if they're listening to this one this one in particular just the the nature of the questions, the way they're asked, very much in a way that is just really seeking to understand. Um, and I also, the, the other thing is to pay attention to is just how we all process things differently. Um, and we discuss this um, in terms of meeting people and where they are. Mm-hmm. And it's often something that we, we talk about is how do you effectively do that? Mm-hmm. And this, I think, episode really demonstrates how we all process the same thing potentially differently. So it's a great representation of that principle. Yeah. So with all that, enjoy the show. Let's know. 
um, I try to notice my senses. So what do I smell? What do I hear? You know, I will physically feel my feet on the ground. I notice what I can touch and noticing all of those different senses um, kind of brings me back to center myself. And I just, you know, said I need a few minutes to sit with myself um, and, and not giving myself a time limit. You know, I'm not saying, hey, I need two minutes and then I'm ready to go. I said, I just need, I need some time. And he said, you know, take all the time you need. And I just sat in the bed. I noticed what what I smelled, what I could physically feel. You know, I noticed my breath. I, I took some deep breaths, um, and just kind of sat with myself, and and just kind of sat with the anxiety. And I used to carry a an index card in my wallet to pull out whenever I had anxiety that said, "You've gotten through this before. You'll get through it again." Welcome back to More in Common. Today we are with Ali Lucchetti. Um, nice work. So, Ali, how are you today? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing very well. Thanks for asking. She's live in LA. Live, live yeah. in LA. Visiting from Chi Town. So, so one of the questions I want to ask you right off, right off the top, is in one of your your most recent blog on allrootswellness.com. Um, you wrote about saying no, uh, and 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 how that has positively impacted you in managing your anxiety. Mm-hmm. How has it done that? Like, what benefits have you seen from from the the impact of saying no rather than yes? Yeah, I, I think that I mean I love the question first of all because I think that this was something I was really excited to share, and learning to say no is something that is a newer development for me. I think that as I kind of tried to look into why do we have such a hard time saying no, you know, I think what it comes down to is this feeling that we need to put anyone and everyone else first, you know, and I'll be, I said this in my blog as well, but I'll be the first one to say that I I think a desire to put others first and to help others is, is great. You know, I, I think that I definitely feed off of being able to help other people, but when it comes down to, you know, if you're spending all of your energy just helping others and not helping yourself. Um, you, you know, I, I want to go into the example that I think I, I think explains it better than than I can with with my words. But I heard an example about helping yourself first that I think made so much sense. So you know, when you're on an airplane and they say, you know, should an oxygen mask drop, make sure to put yours on before helping anyone else, even your children, mm-hmm. even your children. And the reason is is that if you do not put your mask on, if you're fumbling trying to help someone else you know, you may end up not having enough oxygen to help either yourself or them. And I think the same goes for yourself in life. I think that you have to help yourself first before you can help others. Hard to help people if you're unconscious. Yeah, absolutely. And how long have you been saying no? um, It's a newer development. I think it's something I've been working on for a year or so. Said another way is uh, you can't pour from an empty cup. Yeah, exactly. Did you, like, do you have like a people pleaser thing or... Yeah, you know, my my piece with saying no is that, you know, this feeling of, and I think this is, you know, for me personally, my anxiety stems from, you know, not wanting to disappoint others. So feeling like I should say yes to anything and everything. You know, if someone asked me to go out to the bar, I should say yes. You know, I should be able to help a friend. I should be able to take on all these tasks. And the reason that I think saying no is so important and something that I keep reminding myself of is when you say no to something else, you're saying yes to yourself. And we can't feel guilty about saying no. It's okay to not be able to do everything all of the time. And I think that saying no, you reserve your energy for what you're really passionate about, what you actually care about, you know, not, not, I do think that we should say say yes to some unexpected things sometimes. You know, that's how you, you push past the uncomfort and you grow. But I think that knowing I, – I, I think we need to use our, our yeses a little more sparingly and, and more importantly, just know that it it's okay to say no. Do you know um, – are you familiar with Tim Ferriss? Yes. <laughs> I, have a, I have a bro crush on him. 
Yeah, and, I saw your uh, book upstairs. <laughs> yeah, I got it. Well, there's one down here in the closet, too, <laughs> that I'm actually about to mention, Tribe of Mentors, which we don't actually sponsor or nothing like that. But the um, so that book, like, he just wrote all of his all of his mentors and all people he looks up to to ask him to be in the book. And a lot of them turned him down. And his favorite ones he saved and he shared, and he actually did a podcast on it, and just talking about how to say no mm-hmm. and then why. And there were some varying reasons. Like one of them was a writer. And he's like, I'm categorically saying no to all requests over the next six months because I'm working on my next project. Yep. And I need this space to be creative, blah, blah, blah. Like we can talk after that. And there were just a whole lot of different ways to say no. And I think a lot of people, and if, I know for myself, was saying no. Like I always felt like I was being rude. I think that's and I didn't it too. Know how to say it, and it's like, oh well, like, hey, I have to work on this, or I'm working right. on this, or I'm focusing on this. Best to you, you know. And then, and then he actually ended up hitting them back and saying, hey, can I use your note, your rejection letter <laughs> in my book? Because it was actually really good. That's cool. And I agree with you that at least for me, the, the putting others first thing was a what's um, something I struggle with. What what taught me about that and obviously I've heard it in the form of success before and you know say no know when to control your schedule and managing and all that when you talk about managing anxiety um, which you've you know experienced since you were really really young whereas like for me uh, I always had to manage depression and one of the things Mm -hmm. for me was actually saying yes more because getting myself out, going and doing yep. things gave me more energy, gave me more. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting component depending on where you're coming from. If you're hyper you know, active and you're, you, know, you have more anxieties because you're trying to please everybody and you're doing all of these things, important to say no. And if you're isolating yourself and you're upset and sad, it's better to say yes a little bit and really put yourself out there. And the power of those two words on your psyche is really, really, an, it's an awesome thing. And it's a really good blog. So um, I encourage everybody out there to go read it. Um, Thank you. And I think I, I will say one more piece on that saying no versus saying yes is when I was writing it. I was thinking, you know, I have to be careful here because sometimes I, you know, I do speak about the importance of sometimes you have to say yes and you have to push past you know, you, you've got to get through the uncomfortable so that you can get stronger. Mm-hmm. Even with working out, you know, sitting there doing push-ups is not necessarily the most comfortable thing. Um, you know, your first down dog that you get into is not necessarily comfortable, but you have to push past the uncomfortable so that you can get stronger. Yeah. So I did want to be very careful about, you know, saying no and saying yes. And, and I think it just comes down to being really in tune with your needs, I think, at the end of the day. And for me, the reason that I think it's it's important to learn to say no is that, you know, I wasn't listening to my needs. I was paying attention to everyone else's mm-hmm. needs. So learning when to say no and yes to your needs. And being, I think it comes, like, to that being intentional. Absolutely. Your, Absolutely. With your action. So, like, that's super cool. You mentioned anxiety from a young age. Um, let's go into your, your background a little bit. You're, you're a Midwesterner. I am. Like me. Born and raised. Yeah. Where? <laughs> That's what it means, right? <laughs> That's more yeah. Texas, I guess. Yeah, I grew up with yeah, horses and cows. No. Um, <clears throat> so I grew up in Elgin. It is a northwestern suburb of Chicago. And I, I, I talk about this. I'm laughing because I'm going into the Kane County Fair, which I guess does sound like a very Midwestern thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, looking back at you know how I got really started into health and wellness, my first very vivid memory was being at the Kane County Fair and eating a cheeseburger and not feeling so hot. And I don't think I was the first or last person to get sick from a cheeseburger or any food at the Kane County Fair. And But I remember I remember this, um, just, I felt nauseous. And I remember it coming in waves. And I remember being with my mom and saying, I don't feel good. You know, actually, no, I feel fine now. And, you know, I ended up going to the doctor and got a bunch of different tests done and they said I had an ulcer, which I think I did. But looking back at it, I think that I was definitely experiencing some anxiety. You know, that's, I think I had this battle going on in my head of 
oh my gosh, don't be sick. Or, you know, oh, it's, you know, it's okay. I had this like internal battle going on. And I think that's how it happened to my adult life is I kind of get it in these waves. And I think, I remember telling the doctor, like I, I felt this nausea in waves. How, how old were you with that, like for that incident? I was about 10 years old. So, so at, at 10, and I'm curious about this, um, cause you do a great job of writing about this. You think, and based on years of different tests and diagnoses and Mm -hmm. until you actually went to therapy at 19 um you know stress was probably the underlying cause due to anxiety for all of that time at such a young age what was it that um was so anxiety driven for you i'm I'm curious about you know what led to that at an early age even if it wasn't diagnosed or known yeah i i I think it comes down to the nature versus nature versus nurture. Um, I think that, you know, I, my mom says that I was an extremely shy child. Mm. You know, people would come and say hi to my sisters and my older sister was always, you know, saying hi to anyone and everyone. I think my, my younger sister was kind of a mix of two of us, but my mom said people would come and say hi to me and I would just scream and run behind her and hide, which is so funny to people that know me as an adult because I seem like a very outgoing person. Um, I think, I think everyone as kids, you try to process so, you know, things go on and, and my parents um, got divorced and I'm, I think that for me How as a... you when they did that? So it was, um, I, I, I should know this. I, I want to say, I don't know the answer for mine. Yeah. I, I want to say it was like idea. eight, 10. Um, you know, they were, they were separated and obviously tried to, to work it out. Yeah. Without so. getting too much yeah, into, into their business. Um, yeah, they tried to work it out and ended up, you know, they ended up separating, getting back together, ended up divorcing at some point. Um, but I do know as a kid feeling like, oh, you know, they, they were trying to like keep it together for us and feeling like, it, it, I, I think just trying to process all of that as a kid, you know, just experiencing very adult things, but having that child mind and your brain is still growing at that point and you don't know how to process it. And, mm-hmm. and yeah, I think, you know, I've, I've been talking a lot about, you, you know, in therapy, just what we learn as kids. You know, we, we only have so much mental capacity. So like I said, we're, we're experiencing very adult things, but we don't know how to process it. So as we're a, still learning life we're still, too, yeah, right? yeah. Know. I mean, I'm, I'm 31 and I'm still learning, but, <laughs> but as a kid, almost everything goes back to love. So, you know, you might learn that if you, you know, you take a toy from your sister and you know, your mom or dad yells at you. As a kid, you might take this, you might internalize that as, oh, when I take things from others, then I'm not loved. So as a kid, everything goes back to love. So you might learn that when I throw temper tantrums, I get yelled at. And then you take that being yelled at as, oh, they don't love me, which obviously, no, you're just, you're, you're being a brat and they're telling you <laughs> to get your shit together, you know, and they're just, they're just teaching you. But we don't have the, you know, we're just, we're just not smart enough then. And the response to that could be, oh, I need to put put others first or give mm-hmm. all the time instead of I need yeah. to I need and, to get that that love. I need to I need to earn it. It's uh, yeah. And you yeah, being absolutely. an introvert, you internalize everything, so you have yes. to find and a so, way to process it yeah. yourself. And then how do you do that at that age? Right, yeah. right, exactly. And and I I think you know as I a lot of the um, internal family systems is what it's called is the process of of relearning things that you've learned as a kid. So I have a internal, lo- what? internal family systems hmm. and I'm, I'm not a therapist by any means, but I've done a lot of my, my own therapy in working through this. And it's not, it's not anything that, that I did wrong or that my parents did wrong. It's just the way that we learn things sometimes. And Keith has heard this. There's a doctor whose name, is not going to come to me right now. He's a therapist. But he talks about childhood trauma, wounds, Mm -hmm. whatever. And he said, we all have them. And they're really unavoidable. He grew up in Poland towards the end of World War II. And his mom, at some point, gave him to a friend to keep him safe, to keep their Jewish, to keep Mm -hmm. him out of a concentration camp. And he received that as she doesn't love me. Right. 
but because you don't know when you're a kid, you don't know. Sacrifice for her to keep him safe. He understands it now, but like he he looked back at how that affected his adolescence and young adult life. It's not irreversible, right? What you're just but being aware sounds very similar. It is, and I mean, I'm I'm a middle child, so I like to always (laughs) refer to myself as the rebel, but the peacemaker. (laughs) I have you know an older sister, younger sister, very close with both of them, but I think that. Just, just having that middle child role, you know, going between my mom and my dad, and and it feeling like maybe I, maybe I should have done more to kind of keep the whole family together. So you felt like the go between, between I, like your siblings and the and a lot. I mean, consciously no, but I I think subconsciously there might have been a bit of feeling like I was right in the middle. I wrote this internal family system down. I'm interested. We, my brother and sister and I talk about a lot, like how we all perceived our our childhood. It's very, very different. Very, very different. And I think that's the interesting thing about, like, my parents were divorced at two. Rodney's were divorced. Mm-hmm. Your years were divorced. And I've recently been doing a lot of reflection and work in this area of, you know. And I t- actually had a two hour conversation with my mom about some of these these things. Um, and just the impact that it has, the things that we ignore, the things we don't pay attention to, the the attention that we give to certain pieces of information that mold who we end up becoming and how we process mm-hmm. information, is, it's, it's different among people within the same family, let alone across families. And well, it, it absolutely is. I mean, and it, my mom <laughs> would always talk about how I always internalize things. So my older sister. She had that fabulous Italian passion. Mm. So when she would get upset, I'm sorry, Andrea, but I gotta tell the story. It's hilarious. Mm. So when she would get when she would get upset, she would stomp up the stairs, stomp down. She would go in her bedroom, slam her door, open it, slam it again. Which you know, looking back, is is really healthy. She she got her her anger out. Wow. You know, she got how she's upset out. Um, my sister, my younger sister, I think would again in a in a little healthier way would console with my mom and I would just kind of hide in my bedroom so I think I have always internalized things I don't I don't know why really I don't think I was taught yeah you're the same way I, I don't no, think I was taught that you know my parents were always very open open with us and always let us know that we could come to them so I don't I don't really know how or why I learned like hey to internalize things but I think at some point I I just did and it kept going and I that's part what, of it's just innate because we, yeah. we have this emotional coaching thing that we're looking at for Ruby and one of the chapters is about explosive versus implosive mm-hmm. like that's just some yeah. let it go some go slam the door six times let yeah, you know exactly and some you'll never know how they feel I was uh I, my mom always tells me <clears throat> it was as painful to get out of me what she could get out of me as it was once I was finally able to talk to her about whatever it was that was bothering me was right like she would have to drag it out of me um, mm-hmm. because I'm like, yeah, I mean, I'm a, I'm an outgoing introvert, right? I, yep. it, I need my energy from inside. I need my alone time. I need to process Absolutely. things. I, th- I do better when I think about it rather than just talk about it. Whereas like my wife is the complete opposite extrovert, right? She talks, thinks out loud. Everything is verbalized. Everything's vocalized. And it's just a different way of, of processing it. It's, it's uh it's it's always fun navigating those things with different people as you try yeah. to try to you know build relationships <laughs> and get along and learn about how other people do things when they do things extremely different than you. Um, I think it's so interesting going into to therapy like as an adult too, and you know I hear people say, "Oh, I'm I'm fine. I don't need therapy." And the truth is, like I, we're all going through shit. Mm-hmm. Yes. You know, if you're not, it hasn't happened yet. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> or you're, or you're not, you're not paying attention. Or you're, or you're just, just not honest, honest with yourself. Yeah, absolutely, right? absolutely, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. And, and and I think that, you know, it really goes back to the way that our childlike minds process things, and it's we just don't know how yet. So we're processing things, and everything goes back to love and, and learning what we're doing. You know, if it makes us loved or unloved. And as you get older, you know, for me and and Keith, it might be a little bit similar for you, but I had internalized things for. 30 years. Mm-hmm. It's 28 years since I wasn't talking when I came out of the womb. But um, I had you know, spent so much time internalizing everything that you have to reteach your brain. And you have to reach, reteach your, your truths to yourself. Yeah. 
Yeah. I'm sorry. I want to ask something about the tin thing. Yeah, so go for it. The the, the food incident. Mm -hmm. um, so you said they said that they thought it was an ulcer, but you thought anxiety was it was present at that point. So it was an ulcer that was caused by stress. Oh, and it, and but misdiagnosed it as everything under the sun, basically, right? I I think that or I did have as. all of these. You know, I was diagnosed with. I had an ulcer, I had GERD, I had IBS. I do think that physically I had all of those things, but I think that stress played a huge role in all of this. You know, when you look at the physical level, when you're stressed and it increases your stomach acid and you have too much stomach acid, it's, you know, doesn't lead to good things. Um, like ulcers. Leads to things like ulcers, exactly. So, um, I, you know, when I got sick at the King County Fair shortly after, I stopped eating red meat. So... That was when my initial interest in health started, but I don't think there was as much of a conversation around mental health. I don't know that people knew how stress really, you know, affected affected us and affected yeah. people. So that as it can, that it can manifest a, absolutely as a ten year old, I wasn't saying, symptoms. "Hey, you yeah. know, I need I need some time to go meditate in my room. Yeah. Give me fifteen minutes." <laughs> <laughs> as I got older, I think you know, in high school, knew that I was a very high stress person and. Mm. You know, my mom would always say I was a perfectionist, and I would say, you know, because if I was a perfectionist, then it would be better. <laughs> <laughs> so, that is an example of a perfectionist. <laughs> I know That's you, amazing. I know you have a question about anxiety. Like, how does it present for you? I heard that somebody say that it's kind of like taking the worst case scenario and then thinking about that in all the different ways it could happen. But I, I like. I've never personally experienced that, mm -hmm. so I don't. What? How does it manifest for you? Yeah, so I, it manifests in a few different ways. You know, when it sometimes it pops up out of nowhere. So how I try to explain it to people is, you know, for, my best friend doesn't have anxiety all the time, but is terrified of flying. So I had said to her, the way that you feel when you get on a plane is how I feel every day, and and not right now because you know I, I'm I've done better at managing it, but at its worst. That's how I feel constantly, every day. So it's like a constant fear, almost? It's like a constant fear, a fear that something is going to go wrong. You know, I, and I think that there, it, there's definitely like a spectrum of anxiety. I'm not in a, in a stage of extreme panic every day. But on a more day-to-day -day basis, it is my mind constantly okay. thinking about what ifs. Well, what if this happens, and then what if this happens? And, and I think that the... I think that subconsciously my brain is thinking, hey, make sure you plan out the worst possible scenario so that you're prepared if it happens. You Have you been hospitalized for a panic attack or anxiety before? I, I have, yeah. yes. It's terrifying, yeah. yeah. It is, and, and, and at that point you think you're you're having a heart attack, you think something's wrong, and it's it's so easy to, when you are not having anxiety or you're not experiencing anxiety or you've never experienced it, and even for me to look back at my panic attacks and say, you know, clearly you're not, you're healthy, you work out, you're not having a heart attack. But when you are in that, it is, it's almost like you are in the middle of a snow globe and you can't see anything else that's going on. You've got all these snowflakes shaking up around you and it's, it's very much like a tunnel vision. Mm -hmm. So, and your, your senses are extremely mm -hmm. heightened. So, you know, I feel like I can't breathe. My heart's going a million miles per hour. It feels like it's literally going to jump out of my chest. And it, it, it's almost that feeling of, <laughs> and I've gone skydiving, so I, I know I'm kind of a crazy person for that. But when you're about to jump out of a plane, <laughs> and if you, were, if you were sitting there in an open plane all day, I mean, that would be terrible. Yeah. <laughs> that would be me. terrifying. That'd be horrifying. Yeah. <laughs> and the only reason I, you know, ended up ended up actually jumping out of the plane is I got I remember going to the edge of the plane and thinking, Hold on a second. I think before I could even finish that sentence. They just jumped, jumped yeah. Yeah. And the reason I wanted to do that is because I felt like if I could jump out of a plane I could I could do anything. It was definitely very empowering. Definitely recommend it. Definitely terrifying, but so I would good. do it again. <laughs> so good. How long good. how long would your panic attacks last? Um, and when was the last time you were hospitalized for one? It's been a couple of years. Okay. So has there been multiple instances? Yes, a yeah. few times. Yes, the worst I was, I was home alone. I think 
yeah, I was home alone. I ended up having to call 911 because I felt like I was, I had this fear like I was going to have a heart attack and die alone at home. Was, so do you remember like how it started, like what the initial thought was and then did it like snowball and like cascade? Or I don't remember it, what the initial thought it was. It, I think it just, it, it does snowball very fast and I I don't always know what the first initial trigger is, and and that's a lot of what you work fast, through. Is it we talk? Are we talking seconds, minutes, hours? Like how is it? It, it I think it starts in a, a matter of some kind of thought happens, and within thirty seconds, sometimes it's within a few minutes. It just it depends on how quickly you can identify your triggers. So you know, I have been. I actually you know went off my anxiety medication a few months ago because I'm. Um, I, I just wanted to <laughs> just you know I, I at some that. point I, I get at some point I I I, I want to have kids and I don't think that you can be on that medication. A long story short is that um, I felt like I was in a place where my anxiety was managed enough and it was I think just that middle child rebel in me more so that wanted to say can I survive my anxiety? Can I manage my anxiety without medication? So we were going out to a bar with friends, you know, a couple weeks ago and I started to experience some anxiety and I just kind of had to sit down and, and for me, and I think a lot of people who experience anxiety, we get anxiety about our anxiety. Mm. So I started to feel it and, fe- and felt like, where is this coming from? I, I haven't felt anxiety for a while. So then I start, you know, it, it's almost like you're, you're going down, um, not a ski lift, that's what gets you up. But it's almost like you're, you know, you're... Oh, like a like a ski jump. A ski jump, yeah. It's almost like you're going down a ski jump. You know, once you start, it just keeps going. So for me, I was thinking, how do I have this anxiety? Like, where did this come from? Why is this showing up all of a sudden? Um, but what I was able to do is just sit down and, and identify, okay, why am I feeling anxiety? So anxiety about anxiety. is that Does that mean you start, start to feel it and you're like, Oh shit! I know what's coming, like, or what could be coming, or what does that what does that mean? It's mostly like, um, just kind of annoyed that I have it. At that time, I was thinking, I was thinking, why do I have anxiety? This isn't a good time for this. This, this isn't a good time for this. Exactly. So for me, a lot of my anxiety comes from the word "should." So for me, at that point, I was feeling like I shouldn't have anxiety. I shouldn't be feeling this right now. I should feel okay. I should feel better, and. All that's doing is, you know, it's the, the the devil on my left shoulder having a conversation with the chick that's hanging out on my right shoulder, and they're just going at it, saying, "You shouldn't be feeling like this. You should go out." So, where the anxiety came from in that instance was, I was going out to a bar, which can sometimes give me a little bit of anxiety, and I felt like I was in what I call a lose lose situation. So, I felt like if if I stayed home and took care of myself and didn't go out, then that would mean that like I was being a bad friend. I wasn't going out to be there for my friends. Mm. But if I was going to the bar, I could end up having a panic attack in the middle of the bar. So for me, those situations were lose-lose. So what I've learned helps me in those situations, and I, you know, I told my boyfriend is that I said I just need to know that I have an out and that it's okay if I don't go. Like if you tell me that it's okay if I don't go, I'm, I probably am going to go, and I, I did end up going out. Um, but it's just. It's like a fear of the unknown, a fear of not knowing. Like feeling, so having the out, like so you, so you're feeling well, lose, lose. You're feeling trapped. Absolutely, it's it's feeling like claustrophobic almost. Like internally claustrophobic. Mm. If, yeah, yeah, feeling like I'm not going to have, a, it, and it, that all goes back to the should. Like, it, and there, it's not like I sh- I should have gone to the bar. I should have stayed home. Like at, at the end of the day, there it, should is such a toxic word in my vocabulary mm. that. I need to stop. The only thing I really should be doing is, is at the end of the day, enjoy my life for me because no one's going to do that for me. Mm-hmm. You know, and that is something that I keep coming back to is I have to live my life for me. No one's going to do it. Have you found, going back to using the word no, this is an interesting tie, has, has it, how have you eliminated that? How has that not been a trigger for you? saying no or is saying no the empowering thing that gives you the okay to not do something so should doesn't even come into play okay yeah i mean i I think you hit the nail on the head i think that saying no does become empowering and i think that the i think that the words no and the words should very much go hand in hand Mm -hmm. so there's nothing that i you know should be doing 
It's not like I should go to the bar. I should be a good friend. I should be a good partner. It's all the word should comes from all of these false truths that I believe about myself. Like mm-hmm. feeling like if you don't go to the bar, you're a bad friend. If you don't go out, you're a bad partner, uh... which is is not true at all. But it, the word should stems from these false beliefs that I have about myself that if I don't do this then that means this. Mm. And so being able to say no in those situations and, and you know, for me, be, just being able to verbalize and say, hey, I'm having some anxiety right now. You know, I need to tell you that I might not go out and I need you to be okay with that. Interesting right. transition on this because you, you've kind of really alluded to this idea of managing your anxiety and you wrote in mm-hmm. your on your page um, that you've realized you can't get rid of the anxiety. Like, yes. And so how did you come to that realization? And then ultimately, like, what are your tricks? Other, I mean, you've got no, stay away from the word should. Um, telling someone, hey, this is causing me a little anxiety right now. If I don't go out, please be okay with it. Are there other ways that you manage this regularly being okay that it exists? Like it, it sounds like you've accepted it as a reality. Yeah, I I mean, I think I'm constantly working to accept it as a reality. And I'll say something that I didn't want to hear that anyone that has anxiety doesn't want to hear. But once you have anxiety, that is likely very much your personality and you need to be okay with it. Mm. And so I went to therapy first time, you know, worked some ish out. And went back a second time and said, okay, but I already worked through all this, so I shouldn't be having anxiety again. And there I go with the word should. But I went Mm. back and said, I already worked through this. I was already on medication. I should be healed. Mm. I should not be having anxiety again. And that was something that was really, really hard for me to accept is that I might always have anxiety. I mean, and when you're feeling constant anxiety, I mean, it's exhausting. It's feeling like you're constantly, like you had too much caffeine, but you're also exhausted because Mm. Feeling like you're constantly you're like jittery under- and on edge, and at the same time, like just ready to pass. Yeah, out. I mean, think about going at your max for your workout mm-hmm. all day. That's that's kind of what you're doing with your mind. Um, but huh. I, I think what going back to your question about how I manage my anxiety, it's just it's knowing that it's okay to have anxiety. Um, and I and I think something that is really helpful is that that is the way that stress presents itself in me. So everybody gets stressed and it comes out in different ways. Some people overeat. Some people don't eat enough. Some people cry. Some people yell. Some people retreat and have depression. Some people retreat and have anxiety. It's just the way that stress prevent, wow, that stress presents itself. And so for me, it's understanding that that's just the way that I process things and that it's Mm -hmm. okay. And I think that is a big piece of why I'm trying to open up in this blog is that I just want people to know that, that it's okay. How did you come to that place? Cause when you, and I keep, I don't want to spoil all of your blogs, but <laughs> that, that sparked a lot of questions. When you first went to a therapist, you seemingly were ashamed of it. You, you were shy. You didn't want anybody to know you called, mm-hmm. made your first appointment from a car where no one could see you. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, so, how did you like at what point did you get through that cuz you're you're especially as an introvert you're very comfortable talking about this and i can't imagine or at least you present as comfortable i don't know how comfortable you actually are but how have you gotten to that place where talking about it so other people can talk about it is important and there shouldn't be a stigma even the stigma that you used to have about it lots of talk therapy <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I, when I first, I mean, my mom said, I think you're having some anxiety. It was something that it, there was a huge stigma about it. And I, it, and I know I keep coming back to the word should, but I felt like, well, anything that I'm going through, I should be able to manage. I should be able to get through this. I shouldn't have to go to talk therapy. Mm-hmm. And the thing that I'll say about talk therapy is that, I mean, I am such an advocate for it. I mean, some of the most successful people in the world have gone to therapy because again, we all have, we've all got shit that we, that we've got to figure out. Um, but I didn't know anyone else that had it. You know, I felt like I was the only one that I was 
weird that there was something wrong with me. And it was this feeling like I, I shouldn't be experiencing this. I should be a straight A student. I should be, you know, going out and dancing and going out with my friends and I should be able to do it all. And the first time that I, that I heard someone else tell me they have anxiety was actually Amber and we were at Urbanite for, huh. yeah, we were, we were out for a dance show and I had said, okay, I'm just going to maybe say something about my anxiety, just open up a little and said, yeah, you know, I have, I have anxiety just in general. Um, I, w- I wasn't staying the night and that was why I was telling people I, why I was driving home. And she said, oh, I have anxiety too. And I felt this huge weight lifted off my shoulders feeling like here's this person that is an incredible person, incredible dancer. She's successful. This person that seems Super like she together. has it all together yep. and she has anxiety. And that was the first piece in, it, it just, it made me feel so much better to know that I wasn't the only person. And over the years, you know, I tried to, to open up to people around me and then I had people open up to me and say, wow, I had no idea. And so that was a big, I think a big encouragement for me in opening up is that it, I felt like if, if I could help one other person feel okay with their anxiety or maybe help them on the path to like learn how to manage their anxiety, that I would feel better. And the response from my first blog post, which was terrifying to post, yeah. and I wrote it and I was, was you know proofreading it. I got halfway through and I literally put my computer down. I said, I don't want to do this. Yeah. I can't do it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. let's talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> Because I'm familiar with that moment. Yeah. I don't, As am I. I As am I. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I would not say I suffer from anxiety. However, that first, I found a lot of reasons to delay hitting yeah. publish on the uh, first sure. episode. Because there's all this like internal expectation. Like, I'm Absolutely. putting all this out there and I'm going to get lambasted and like we're going to get feedback. It's going to be horrible. Yeah. It's, like, it's terrifying. The real truth is like no, nobody really cares. Right. And then the ones that do... The ones that are interested actually do care a lot and right. get something from it. And it's we're not we're not cool. successful enough in this endeavor to get trolls just yet. Yeah. <laughs> my, bro- my brother trolls me. So. You've got trolls, and <laughs> yeah. you're successful. Uh, yeah, that's right. As soon as you get that first troll, it's like I made it. <laughs> yes. Our next shirt, our next success. Shirt on the back, I just want looking for trolls. Yeah, yeah. success yeah. equals trolls. Yeah, that's right. Me, at more and common pause, looking for trolls. That's all. Awesome. <laughs> we made it. That's amazing. Can't wait till we get trolled. Um, yeah, uh, we went on off the troll tangent. Uh, um, well, so like you said, your mom mentioned that you might have anxiety. How old were you when she said that? I was eighteen or nineteen, and I think it, this is something that I haven't opened up on a lot. But I think I was dealing with both anxiety and depression. Mm. I think that for me, That's like double. That's a lot. It was a double whammy. Double cheeseburger there. Um, not the one from the Kane County Fair. <laughs> um, Getting a lot of... I, I think if... I, I just... I felt very isolated. And I didn't under, understand what was going on. I didn't understand why it was happening or why it was happening to me or... I, yeah, it was just... It was very isolating. I felt like something was wrong with me. And I think that... You know, I just continued to internalize things and... My anxiety was so high that it made me hit a low as well hmm. because I was constantly feeling so anxious that it was physically and mentally draining me that I was just exhausted mm-hmm. and I was retreating from my friends. I was retreating from my family. I didn't understand what was going on with myself and I think that, you know, that goes to another point of, of explaining to other people and, and why there is such a stigma about it. I don't think that people want to have a stigma. I think it's that people don't understand it. And if we don't understand it ourselves, how can we expect other people to, to understand it? You said something interesting about that, that stigma piece. Um, when you mm-hmm. were going through it and talking about it, I should be able to fix this. I should be able yep. to do this myself. And if, you know, when you when you talk to somebody and ask them, like, who's – there are people who've just never experienced uncontrollable mental health or mental illness issues, things that you cannot do anything about other than feel bad about yourself for being in that situation. Right. And the expectation, especially in America where it's, you know, you know, merit-based, pull yourself up from the bootstrap and go is fix it. 
Like, do something. It's your brain. Fix it. Just go. And you should be able to do that. And I think that's ultimately how, where that stigma, I've been thinking about this a lot and I've been asking a lot of people about it because that stigma of should is, Mm -hmm. is ultimately why people think, well, if you think I should, because you're doing it, I should be able to do it. Why am I not doing it? And then I'm not going to talk to anybody about it because the only people are going to say is, why aren't you fixing it? Like what, what is wrong? And, And the analogy always has to be, it's like, well, if you broke your wrist, would you just go home and cast it up yourself and, you know, fix it? If you needed surgery, would you cut yourself open and, and do whatever you needed to do? But even then intervention would still be needed. Yeah, right. even, but even then, I, I was just thinking about this as you were saying, like, that's another part of the problem. If I do get a cut, like, I there's a discrete fix. Right. right. And it will heal. Right. And, and, let's, like, and I can see it, and it's, I know what the problem is, and I know it can heal, and I know when it's healed. Mm-hmm. And I thought about this when you said I, I, anxiety might be a part of my personality. Like, yeah. it doesn't heal. Right. Like we're used to a broken bone. You give it eight weeks, it heals. Yeah. I can go back out. If you cut yourself, um, I cut myself, throw some Neosporin on it. But if your parents get divorced, my parents get divorced, and your parents get divorced, a different fix for each one of us, depending absolutely. on how we internalize it and process it. It becomes really, really yeah. complex and hard. Brain's a funny thing. Yeah, yeah. it sure is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One of the things you told us is you came off um, your medication four months ago. And mm-hmm. I remember, so I used to be um, on antidepressants way back in the day, and I came off, and I have not gone back. Um, but I'm curious how that those four months have been for you, and what's like, what's the future hold for that? Like, do you want to continue not taking it? Um, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so I will start by saying that I don't think that – there's anything wrong with taking medication. I do think that there's a bit of stigma around medication as well. And when I was first diagnosed with anxiety, I went on medication and I did it with talk therapy. And that at that time, my anxiety was so paralyzing that I, I was terrified to even go to talk therapy. And so I think for me, I needed that that kind of one-two punch to, to work through things. And I've been on and off anxiety, you know, medication over the years. And I, I really think that I've done a lot of personal work in the last couple of years, which is why I chose to go off medicine. Um, but I, I do want to put that out there that I don't think there's anything wrong. I think a lot of people kind of feel like, and going back to that word should, but they shouldn't take medicine. They should be able to exercise more they should be able to smile more and they should be able to be okay without it and it would it, would it be accurate to say from what you just said i think i kind of heard um it's all it, it, if you were drowning the medicine helped you get above water so that you could actually deal with yes. the situation maybe absolutely yes yes absolutely um well, way to complete that <laughs> <laughs> Hey, man, mind melt. Y'all are good co-hosts together. Five junkies, five junkies. Working together as a team. Yeah. Um, but I think that it's, it's, it's interesting. I've definitely had a heightened sense of emotion. And I am not a person who historically, I, I don't cry a lot. I don't think there's anything wrong with crying. I've always... You know, growing up, I get this. Yeah, growing up, I always felt like there was nothing wrong with anyone else crying, but I never wanted to cry. That's not me. Which I've learned to embrace that a little more. But but going off the anxiety medication, definitely have a heightened sense of emotion. And I'll give you a great example: is that I was I was home alone. My boyfriend left the golf channel on, and some guys on TV talking about you know I'm so happy that I found this in my life. And I just start crying. It's like, I'm so happy for him. And I realize I'm crying at the golf channel. That's I'm awesome. like, what is going on? <laughs> I'm so happy. He's probably talking him. about like some new golf ball. And you're like. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, oh, it's a beautiful moment. Um, but it's been good. I, I definitely have been making sure to check in with myself more. And I think that. You know, I do a lot of work. I meditate every day. I do a lot of work on mindfulness. I think it is a constant journey. I don't. I don't think that there is an end game to that. It's just kind of a constant 
did the medicine make you feel any certain type of way? Um, it definitely helped with the the constant panic. I mean, and, I mean, I think like you said, it helped me mm. get to the top of the water so Sorry. that I could then swim. Um, were there any negative feelings? Uh, yeah. So um, uh, feelings? Is that the right word? Was it yeah, any emotions. Side effects? Yeah, side effects. Yeah. I, luckily, I, I didn't have any side effects. I think some people say that you know some people have gone on it and said they've they fell down or they've gained weight. Luckily for me, I, di- I didn't have any negative side effects. And I think that it was, it just, yeah. So I was taking Zoloft every night and then I would have Xanax for if I was ever feeling like I was going to have a panic attack. So the Zoloft is what I I went off of, um, which I was taking taking that every night. And it's been, um, it's been good. Yeah. So meditation, being present. Yes. Helps. Do you have... So that the other day when you when you were going out or not mm-hmm. or thinking about it, you started to have an attack. Do you have any tricks for bringing yourself like to to the present moment, or do you just like meditate on the spot, or like what, what kind of things do you do? Yeah. So I when I notice myself having anxiety, it's something that I you just love. Break out, like in the, in the yeah, middle of the L, I was just gonna meditating. say that. Yeah, I just sit in my Buddha position, <laughs> push my belly out, deep breaths. No. Um, I try to notice my senses. So what do I smell? What do I hear? You know, I will physically feel my feet on the ground. I notice what I can touch. And noticing all of those different senses um, kind of brings me back to center myself. And I just, you know, said I need a few minutes to sit with myself um, and, and not giving myself a time limit. You know, I'm not saying, hey, I need two minutes and then I'm ready to go. I said, I just need, I need some time. And he said, you know, take all the time you need. And I just sat in the bed. I noticed what what I smelled, what I could physically feel. You know, I noticed my breath. I I took some deep breaths. um, And just kind of sat with myself and and just kind of sat with the anxiety. And I used to carry an index card in my wallet to pull out whenever I had anxiety that said, you've gotten through this before, you'll get through it again. And it's just that I think that feeling that it's okay to have anxiety. So for me, just, just sitting with it and saying, okay, I'm having some anxiety. What am I anxious about? And maybe trying to figure it out. But more importantly, just kind of giving myself an internal hug and saying, it, it's okay. It's okay to have anxiety. It's understandable that you would have anxiety kind of thing. One of the things that um, to ask this question, how long – has it taken you to get to the point where you feel confident enough that meditation and all of the exercises that you do, you have control over them that you can manage your anxiety enough so you can be off medication versus it being some quick fix? Right. Well, I I will say first and foremost that I've had to let go of the word control. I think a lot of people that have anxiety feel like they should be able to control it. And the more, I mean, it, it's like a toddler, I think. The more you try to control it, the crazier it gets. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> As that, yeah. sometimes you just got to let it go. You got to let it go. <laughs> um, but uh, Big big props to uh, <laughs> Disney movies. <laughs> songs, let it go. I won't sing. Not yet. It's too early, it's too early to sing. Um, no, I, I mean, I, I don't think that I've reached, um, you know, it's not like I've, I've reached my end point of, you know, I've done this work and now I'm successful and everything is great. I think it, it's constant. And I I think that my anxiety has been kind of a blessing in disguise because it's made me really learn more about myself. And that's something that I've really been enjoying doing is just getting getting to know myself. And It's kind of like your monster. It's your Hulk. Yeah. Like it's always there. Yeah, absolutely. And you have to – and you met, you're using meditation in my – Mindfulness. Gotta make the Hulk incredible, you know. Yeah. Is there is there a nutritional component for you? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that I believe a lot of health starts from the inside out, both from a nutritional perspective and from a like the soul perspective. Um, but I, I I definitely think that there is nutritional piece to it. You know, when I started my blog, I wanted to open up about mental health. And also, my happy place is in the kitchen. I think this comes back to me being the middle child and being the rebel is that 
I don't like to follow rules, so that's why I like cooking because I'll look at various recipes and then kind of make my own thing. Throw them out. Yeah, baking, terrible, terrible baker. I have to follow rules. I don't like yeah, it. There's no variation. I, I know that I need to like follow the exact rules, and I, I still break them, and so that's why I don't bake. Um, but cooking, I love, but that is that is my happy place when I can create something healthy. Um, that's another reason I started my blog so that I could – I was always creating different kind of recipes, just throwing things together. Those little cashew balls you brought were magical. Yeah, they'll be good. <laughs> I got, I got little, little, mm. little protein bites, they were mm. good. Um, but people were asking for the recipes, so I figured it'd be nice to have a, a platform to kind of talk about all things health and wellness. Um, Do but, you feel, with regards to anxiety specifically, if you're eating, say, a shittier, crappier diet... Yeah, I feel shittier. Does it make you more prone to anxiety like a, is attack the right word or episode i don't know I, I don't know that it you know i think that there are definitely you know like lemon balm and, and lavender tea and things like that that can be calming but i think that my body and my mind function better when they are given all the right nutrients mm. you know if i am you know let's say i, I eat like complete crap for a week i'm probably going to be really tired if I'm tired, I'm probably going to be a little crankier, a little more agitated. And, you know, if I'm crankier and agitated, I'm probably not getting as much done at, at work, in my personal life, and that's going to lead to more anxiety. So I, I think that it is definitely a trickle effect. But I I just I feel better. I feel like I can be more productive. I can get done what I need to do. I can take care of myself and I can take care of others when I am eating right, when I'm exercising, when I'm getting all the you know, the nutrients that I need. Um, and the exercise is huge, is huge. For me. It's, oh, it's yeah. a, yeah. it's amazing how I think generally undervalued. We talk a lot about exercise. People talk a lot about diet and people talk about diet in the form of weight loss and fitness. And people talk about exercise in the form of weight loss and fitness. But the, the importance of it from a hormonal perspective, from a motivational perspective, because like, I'm very much the same way on the depressive side. If I ate yeah. fried food for a week, I then wouldn't work out because I was exhausted and I felt like crap. And then all Absolutely. of a sudden, three weeks later, I feel miserable because I don't want to do anything. And now I'm worthless because I haven't done anything and I haven't worked Absolutely. well. It's I haven't done spiral. anything. It's all of a sudden you're here. Whereas... Just having that regular routine, I even notice it now for the first time in my life since Rodney and I started a burpee challenge, I've been working out <laughs> I love it. five to six days a week. I've always aspired to Amazing. work out five to six days a week, but it was always like three, four days a week. Five right. to six days a week, if I miss a day, it is an awful day. Like I have mm -hmm. to spend so much mental energy trying to get into a good space, not because uh, I feel bad that I missed the workout. It's because my body just didn't do what it needs to do during that yeah. period of time. Yeah. It's just, I mean, it's so good for you, but from a, it's just everything about it. I mean, it, it physically, you know, you, you feel better mentally, you feel better. And so core power is what got me into working out consistently because I loved, I just the feeling of sweating and accomplishing something and pushing yourself for an hour. And then that, you know, almighty savasana at the end of class where you just sit and reflect and... Core power yoga? Core power yoga, yeah. yeah. So it, I do the yoga sculpt a lot, but there's just something... I, I feel like it encompasses everything. You get the sweat session, you get the, the weight training, you get some cardio in there because you're constantly moving, um, and you get the, the mental piece of it too. I, I mean, because you're getting... Yeah. You're getting, like Keith said, hormones, endorphin Absolutely. releases, you're getting like... And then the mental piece push, like... You yep. said you said you had a card in your purse that said you you've gotten through this before. Mm -hmm. Like I think there's on the mental aspect of doing a workout where you feel like you're pushing yourself to your limit and then going further or sustaining. And then like for me, I do that in the morning and it makes my day easier. It does, yeah, because you're setting yourself up for the right. You know, you're setting the tone for your day and you're telling yeah. yourself. I'm strong. I can do this. Like I just did a hundred burpees. Like, come at me with your email, bro. Like, <laughs> like, you can't really mess up my day with the email anymore. <laughs> yeah. You said something about core power and how it's the it's the exercise that consistently gets you to work out. And I think there's an important mm -hmm. thing to call out there, um, especially for anybody. It's like I lift every day. Rodney does his thing every day, and you do the core workout and probably other things. 
And there are so many different things that we're all aware of now that are potential for workouts. And it's about finding the exercise mm -hmm. that works right for, for you, right? Because, you know, doing one thing may not work for me the same way it works for you. And if it doesn't right. motivate you to get there, then it's not the right one for you. And if it's yeah, just walking every day and that's the thing that you love and it gets you going, then that's the thing you should do. But we should all get our blood flowing, our hormones released yeah, well, and all of that. Walking is a fantastic, yep. you know, just most- getting those endorphins uh, flowing, mm -hmm. you know? I was listening to a, the head doctor for the U.S. Olympic team, and he's like, every body should walk more. He's like, the number one pre-workout and post-workout he recommends should be walking. Olympic athletes yep. is walking. Um, one last question I have as we start to wrap up, Allie. You're an introvert. You've internalized your entire life. You've recently started this blog that we've talked about throughout the episode and really spent years getting comfortable sharing with friends, with therapy. And now here you are on a podcast that gets broadcast to hundreds of people. Millions. Yeah. <laughs> Millions. I'm just, Billions. I'm just, yeah. I'm just claiming, yeah. I'm claiming accomplished. How, how has this experience been for you talking to, you know, one person that you just met and obviously another friend in, in telling a lot of your story and quite frankly, a lot more that you've even written down at this point. Yeah. I, I mean, I think, I think it's been great. It's been healing to continuously open up and, you know, I, it goes back to, you can't tell other people what what you won't tell yourself. You know, you can't tell other people that it's okay to open up and not, and not do it yourself. And I think that that is what I am trying to do. You know, when I, when I write in my blog, I pretend like I'm writing to someone on the other side of the world that I will never see, but needs it. Or I pretend like I'm writing to a younger version of myself. And that allows me to write without judgment and just write with, with real honesty and, and write what I think my 17 year old self needs to hear what my doppelganger you know on the other side of the world needs to hear cool um if you could leave our millions of listeners <laughs> <laughs> with a nugget of wisdom or thought and and i'm not going to change that if because you're going to get the opportunity okay. to touch these millions of of years uh what would you say what would you leave them with i would leave them with love yourself. It's okay to love yourself. You should love yourself. I mean, you know, can you imagine the kind of world that we would live in if everyone loved themselves so much, you know, truly and wholly down to their bones, not from, from the ego, but from the heart. They truly love themselves. There'd be a lot less hate, a lot more compassion, a lot more empathy. And I, I think that, you know, not to go like to Miss America on you, but if... if <laughs> I want world peace. Um, no, I just, I, I think that the perspective change that I've noticed in my life when I, you know, now that I'm learning to really truly love myself it is so drastic. And I, I think that is the one piece of advice I would give is, is I want to give someone else the permission to love themselves. Like they wouldn't feel threatened by somebody else having an issue. Yeah. They'd be able. Then they would be fully capable to love them. Absolutely. And let them exist. Yeah. And, and I, I think exist. that I, you know, not to go over on time here, but people that are are nasty to you, or people that are are mean, or you know, not not being compassionate. Something that I like to remember is that how people treat you is a reflection of themselves, not of you. Mm. So if you've got someone that's being nasty at work, nasty to you at work they're probably going through shit and not saying that you need to sit there and, and try to understand it, but don't personalize it. Don't personalize it. I have personalized so many things and just caused me a lot of extra stress and anxiety. And so just understanding, I think it, it kind of helps remove yourself from the situation when you are going through something, when someone is, is treating you unfairly or, you know, treating you nasty. I think that know that it, it is a reflection of what's going on with them.